Tara Elizabeth Connor is an American model and beauty queen who was crowned Miss USA 2006. Following this achievement, Connor became the centerpiece of a public scandal after she was caught drinking underage, using cocaine, and kissing Miss Teen USA Katie Blair at a New York nightclub. When the dust settled, Connor was allowed to retain her title provided she enter a drug rehabilitation program. Since that time, Connor has been sober and she has worked very hard to advocate against drug addiction. Recovery Magazine, Sherry Gaba sat down with Tara to learn more about her personal journey and dedicated work to helping advocate recovery. Tara, you've been talking on USA Today, you did a TED Talks, I saw you on Oprah. Mm -hmm. Why the passion? Because the passion is so clear when you talk about recovery. I think the passion comes from just facing the stigma from the gate. I remember when I did my earliest interviews, I was so excited because even though I was going through this mass humiliation, um, I had discovered something about myself that I didn't know existed and I knew that there were a lot of people out there that were just like me and I was shamed. I was shamed from the beginning. They were calling me disgraced Miss USA and Mess USA and and it it struck a chord because I knew the reason why I never thought that I had a problem was because I didn't look like the people that I thought had a problem, right? And here I am, I was 20 years old, being Miss USA from a very small town in Kentucky living in New York. And I was dying on the inside. And then all of a sudden I wasn't. And I was like, whoa! there's a way out? Whoa! And I was so excited to tell people about it. And while I was trying to do that, I was being asked if I tarnished crowns or if I was a bad role model. And I'm just like, well, maybe. Well, you know, it's interesting. You look at rock and roll stars and it's sort of like, ooh, wow, junkie. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. But when you are, you know, Miss USA, mm -hmm. you're under a whole different type of scrutiny, correct? Right. Yes. What are your thoughts about that? I think that it's just part of our culture. You know, I think a lot of people like to point fingers and put people down because it makes us feel better about ourselves. I've done it. I can still fall victim to that because give me a day where I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm going to look at a girl and be like, <laughs> her butt's out or, oh my gosh, she has on so much makeup or give her a cheeseburger. So what would you say to those people that are judging? I would say, this is my thing. If someone says something to me and it upsets me, there's probably something about that person that I don't like about myself, right? They're a mirror, right? Everyone's a mirror. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what we are. Like, as human beings, we are all mirrors in order to help each other grow and see ourselves through each other. And so a lot of the people that had negative things to say about me probably were struggling with a very similar problem that I was struggling with. Well, right. It's the disease that you go into denial. So yes. it's really easy to point the finger at you know, Miss USA yeah. and not look at your own issue. For sure. Correct. And I was definitely one of those people before, you know, people would come up to me and be like, you know, maybe there's a little problem here. And I'd be like, well, we all have problems, you know, but for me, the addict or the alcoholic or the guy that was struggling with mental illness was the homeless person that lived on Skid Row or, you know, the, the people that lived in the trailer park on Breckenridge. Like it was, I'm from Kentucky, so we have bridges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I never knew that it could be Miss USA or a doctor or a principal or a politician mm -hmm. or any of that. And we just do that. I mean, I was watching the coverage about the governor that just lost his job in Alabama and they're already calling him um, disgraced governor. And it's like, people make mistakes. We're all human beings. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, if you put a microscope on every person living in this country, we all have a few skeletons in the closet, right? But we're so quick to judge each other. We're so quick to put a label like disgraced governor. Well, what's amazing is you do talk about trauma in some of your um, yeah. reports. You talk about um, you know, early molestation, mm -hmm. talk about grief and loss, yeah. uh, divorce, broken home, a lot of the things that have caused you probably to have PTSD in your life. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think that 
played into your addiction or do you think it was more of oh, just born with the disease I have the gene well I'm one of the believers that the disease of addiction is manifested because I can't have an addiction to something until I've done it long enough to become addicted now I can tell you that you know addiction is a is a disease of a threefold nature so you're dealing with a physical allergy that when you trip it off like there's nothing you can do to stop it mm -hmm. And then you have this <clears throat> mental obsession that will tell you you're not that bad or this time it's going to be different or, well, you've been separated long enough. I bet you could have like one drink and be a lady. And then you have this unmanageability slash untreated addiction, spiritual malady. It's all the same stuff. It's that thing that lives inside of us that makes us feel I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, what's the point? Like no one's ever going to love me, I'm never going to be successful, I'm always going to have to compete with her. Like. It's this, this hole that you, you just try to fill and fill and fill. And, 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 and in the beginning, I did it with attention. Like, I just needed attention. Like, see me, you know? And then it was, okay, I'm going to be a gymnast. And I'm going to be the best at it. And I want people to look at me and think that I'm great. Like, I'm great, right? And that and, lasts for about a minute, right? And that lasts for about a minute, you know? It's like when you play poker. Like, you never remember the hands that you win. You just remember the big losses. So that was my life. Like, I just remembered the loss. And... Nothing ever made me feel enough. And the truth is, is I probably was being given everything that a child needed. But my mind told me that that wasn't the truth and that I was unlovable because I, I have like this peculiar mental twist. And so, you know, my life was the perfect storm for addiction. I, I'm pretty sure I was self-medicating. I, I just mm -hmm. at 31 was diagnosed with uh, a severe depression and an anxiety disorder. I have severe ADHD, mm -hmm. which makes so much sense now. But like, I was self-medicating and I self-medicated myself to where I could focus. Like, I can't see what's going on on the, the chalkboard. Like, what, what, I, why am I not getting it? But I was a 4.0 student. It just, I had to work a little harder. And so you functioned for a while until you stopped functioning? No, I functioned until the very end, girl. Like, mm -hmm. I can function. Even if I am a hot mess, like, I can turn it on because it was very, uh, it was implanted in me at a young age, and it's an idea that I developed that if I can make it look good on the outside, then I can convince myself that it's good on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. And so regardless of how I felt or, you know, how much I did the night before, I functioned. I won Miss USA when I was high as a kite, and I which probably took it took you longer to get well because you could function. Right, words, and I, honestly, have... if I wouldn't have gone through that experience, I think I'd be dead because I I'm stubborn, and even in sobriety, like I have to get to a point where my head says I'm done. Right, like I have to get to a point where I'm in such despair and 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 so much pain. It's like a pain that I can't really describe it's it's kind of like that feeling of um a terrible breakup emptiness, or like emptiness, emptiness like the grief it's just constant grief like i was constantly grieving things that weren't gone and and had i not but i was always able to manage like well if i win miss usa that'll make it better well if i get this agent that'll make it better when i get out of russell county that'll make it better that and i did all of those things kept yeah. you going. so how do you stay full now how do you keep that you know what do you have a program do you believe oh, yes. in the 12 steps you know I what sure do this is what happened for me so in my story the beginning was just tara connor miss usa miss usa rehab okay now i'm going to tell you about my experience and then it turned into, when, when the drugs and alcohol were taken away from my life, the real problem is actually there, right? Because it's centered in my mind and in, in my emotional natures. And so here I am, untreated, not knowing that I'm untreated, because I was told, like, hold on to your seat. Don't drink or use no matter what. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I was told, you know, just call your sponsor. Just, you know, go to a meeting. Just go to a meeting. Get into acceptance. Don't forget to tell you all the feelings and the pain show up. Right. The alcohol is gone, then that's the but pain. But I also don't know how to be in acceptance. What does that mean? You don't know how to be in pain. Right. I don't know what, like, I had to write out, like, a, a, a list of 10 reasons why I was powerless over alcohol and 10 ways that made my life unmanageable, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but... You know, the first step in recovery is so much more than that because I, I had to really get to a place where I saw where I lacked power, right? And, and not just with drugs and alcohol because I, I could see that when I put drugs in my body, my mind and my body separate and my head will say, 
this is a bad idea, you should put on a condom, you, you could get raped, there's a gun, and my mind's like, my body's like, yeah, but there's dope right there. And so my head was telling me, run, but my body's like, yeah, but let's just, what if, you know? Mm -hmm. I had to see that I would put my life on the line. And then from a sober state, at eight and a half years sober, uh, when I really started working a proper program, I had to see where I could get everything outside of me that I thought would fix me and feel the, the worst depression that I ever had. Yeah, and you talk scary. about that. You yes. talk about how you can, you can remove the, the, the alcohol, but yeah. you still can feel pretty bad. Well, and of so course. hit one of those bottoms, correct? For sure, yes. I've had a few of those. But I think that that's life. Like, I think that's kind of the process. You don't just put the drink down or put the plug in the jug and then everything's fine. Like, you may not wreck as many cars. Were there things you were doing differently or not doing that... In what way? Uh, feeling those, those dry, drunk periods. Was oh, it my first eight years was a dry, drunk period, and I had no idea. Like, you know how you'll go to a meeting or you'll see someone who's sober, but they're just an asshole? <laughs> Untreated addiction is a very real thing. And I think that, you know, part of the way we view addiction is get them in a detox, let's get them cleaned up, and let's send them to a few meetings, and then they'll graduate. There's no graduating, right? There's no, like, 30-day fix. There's no, like, six-month fix. Like, it's a fix that has to happen over time, and, and it, there's, it's continual growth because as I'm, as I'm learning about my disease, the disease is learning about it as well. And as I learn about recovery, my, my disease is learning. It's going through the book with me, right? So what would you say to that past Tara and that future Tara right now about the disease? I would say keep doing what you're doing every single day for future Tara because my life has completely transformed mm -hmm. in such a short amount of time with just the proper right. step work and uh -huh. going to meetings and all of that. But also, I wish I would have drank. I'm going to be honest. Like a, a lot of people, you know, just say, don't drink or use no matter what. And, and, I, and sometimes if I have people that aren't willing to do the type of work that it takes to get to a recovered state, I tell them to go drink. I'm like, go drink, go smoke. You might live, you might not. But I'm truthfully being sober and being untreated is far worse than being drunk because you have to feel it mm -hmm. and it gets really crazy up there if I'm not taking care of myself and maybe I would have hit a, a bottom sooner maybe I would have tailspin maybe I would have put some needles in my arms and mm -hmm. you know just hit a bottom but unfortunately I have a very strong ego and a very strong amount of pride uh -huh. <laughs> that says, no, you can't do that. So I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of living and having to deal with this being untreated. That sounds a lot worse than dying. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's heavy. I can't even think about having this interview without talking about Trump. Right? Sure. The yeah. person that you worked for. Mm -hmm. And now he has a whole panel that he's setting up mm -hmm. to really look at this opiate uh, you know, epidemic. What are your thoughts about that? What do you think are some of the solutions? I think some of the solutions that we really need to look into is, I mean, the healthcare as it stands right now, we can get treatment and we can get detoxes, but the insurance companies are making it so hard. So a lot of the people who want treatment, only 10% of them will actually get it, right? And if you come from, like, if I tried to get sober back in Kentucky, we didn't know anything about rehabs. We didn't know, where do you get $30,000, $50,000 for a treatment facility? And at the time, insurance didn't cover that. And there's government funded programs, but they're so full that it's impossible to get someone in when, when the time oh, yeah, is right. For sure. And so I think that we really have to change. There's so many things that we have to change. First of all, the stigma is still very much alive, mm -hmm. even within the treatment centers. Like I worked for a treatment center that tried to revise my story so that when I would share, it would sound okay to the people that were listening to it because they, you know, they don't have that problem here. And I'm like, yes, they do. It's, wow, it's so by, still creating that shame base. Right. And, and keeping it a secret. Keeping right? it a secret. Yeah, which is the whole they were reason like, why people... Don't talk about being molested. We don't have the resources. I'm like, get the resources. Why don't you have the resources? Wow. I'm like, wow. that's part of my story. Wow. And so it was just frustrating because if you look at, if you Google me online, it talks about me kissing girls and doing rails of blow and like dancing on tables. But then like if I speak, they're like, can you make sure that she looks conservative? It's like, when do I... 
If you Google me, it talks about me doing rails of blow. And I'm sure now, being the sober woman that you are, you're like, no, I'm going to speak my truth. Yes. I'm going to be authentic. Now, way back then, when you first got sober, it's like, I, okay, what do you want me to do? I'll no, be a good little so girl. Scared. A good yeah. little Miss USA. And because it's like, no, I I'm was not just do that. trying to prove to everyone that I really wasn't the asshole that they thought I was. Right? Right. right. Because I, I did have good intentions, and I did have a really good heart, but I, I lacked the power to do anything about it. Like, I couldn't will myself to be in a good mood. I couldn't will myself to get up 10 minutes early. I couldn't will myself to do anything. I mean, the bottom line is the alcohol and the drugs are just the symptoms. It's, it's all just, those other issues that right. need to be talked about because that those are the things that bring people to their knees. Yeah, and it talks about, in the doctor's opinion, how we are restless, irritable, and discontented unless we can experience the ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a drink, which means our natural state is being restless, irritable, and discontented. So of course I'm gonna drink. Like when I see people who are dry and they have like over 30 years and they are just like so miserable, I'm like, gosh, they just need to drink. They just do, like they are suffering. Right, right. <laughs> do something because you know, getting clean and sober is not about stopping the drink or drug. That's the crumbs. I'm clean and sober right now. Great, why do I have to do anything else, and right? there's only one step that talks about that. The rest, one. the other 12 are it's how to live. It's an inside job. Exactly, for sure. Yeah, so I mean, I, there's so much that we have to do. I, I don't know why we, we don't have uh, a prevention program nationwide that's in place that's effective, you know? It's almost like the war on drugs times two. It's, mm -hmm. it's, that's where it starts. I think it's 80 or 90 percent of addicts, their their addiction starts in adolescence. They're, they're starting to drink at 11. Yes. I mean, that's... that's I mean, I was, at, I was 14. But 11? Right. Yeah. What would you say to that teenager wanting to dabble, thinking that they're only recreational, t taking an opiate or, you know, smoking some pot? Or yeah. Would you say, oh, that's a gateway drug or don't no, do I it? No, I hate those or, words. Listen, they showed me a f like a pan with an egg on it like this is your brain on drugs and I was like wow that looks awesome <laughs> you know like that's not scary and then I would have officers try to scare me straight and they would show me like car accidents where people like went through the window and died and I'm like well too bad for them you know but no one ever told me their story. I was just going to say, you going into that high school and telling your story to me is the number one preventative. Right. Because I think you, it comes from it. experience. It, yeah. it, you can't tell a kid what to do and what not to do. And you also can't t like speak to them as if they are children. Because by the time they're in high school, they I know for me, I already felt I thought I knew better than my parents. Right? So I can't hear it from a counselor. I can't hear it from my principal. I, I can't hear it from you my parents. You gotta hear it from someone who's been there. Right. And, and you know, even if they don't get it then, maybe it's a seed that's planted, It's a seed. Right? Like the message isn't don't do drugs because let's be real. You know, mm -hmm. the message is, well, you can, but just know that at this age, you're 45% more likely to become dependent. Mm -hmm. Your brain is still developing. So you're stunting your emotional growth. You're messing with your brain chemistry. Um, it's going to be very hard for you to be happy without having a drug or a drink after one drink. Mm -hmm. And you're playing Russian roulette with your life. This is what happened to me. I've been raped. I've been in terrible situations where I could have been killed. I've had friends die going on runs to get drugs for me. Like, it's a dark life. And the whole those time the I was in it. Those are they need to hear. They right. Need to hear those stories. Like, I never thought, like... I never thought anything was going to happen to me. Because all of my friends got arrested. I didn't. You know, I should be in jail. I've committed crimes. I so appreciate your transparency, Tara. I Thank mean, you. really telling us the truth. That's what we really need to hear. Yeah. What would you say to a family member, you know, at Sober Recovery Center? Those are the people that usually we talk to. Those are the ones that call first. Right. What would you say to that family member who's done the round robin and tried over and over again to get their child or their spouse sober? The bottom line is that people, even if it's a kid, <laughs> they have to have their own experience. And the worst thing that we can do is show them that they have a way out without having to take the hard road. And the hard road is actually getting sober and working a program and, and getting the help that you need and, and making that a daily practice in your life forever. Because if not, I mean, I know a lot of people that they'll relapse and then their girlfriend will be like, well, he's, 
he's out of treatment. So, and it's like, yeah, but you know that he's, you're letting him back in. Like, let him get some time under his belt. Like, he doesn't even love himself yet. How do you expect him to love you back? So, you, do you take kind of a tough love approach? Or do, oh, you, yes. or do you navigate somewhere between tough love and still, you know, supporting their recovery? I, I support recovery. I don't support bullshit. So I had a girl hitting me up on Twitter, not Twitter, Instagram last night. And I guess I met her like a few years ago and she was just, no, this was like 10 years ago. And she was like, I've been to five treatments and now I'm like putting needles in my arm. I'm not mocking her, but I don't care. You know what to do. You've been to treatment. You just don't want to do it. Right? So she knows that <clears throat> there, there are meetings every day all day long. If you really don't want to drink or use, stay in a meeting every hour on the hour. Meet with people, get coffee. There's a bunch of us that are sober, right? And we have a good time. Is this how you got sober? Was this the sort of direction that you got that worked for you? No. What happened for me was that I had death threats from Afghanistan and an entire nation calling me a disgrace. And my pride is what got me sober initially, mm. right? But what got me into recovery, <laughs> and those are two different things. Two completely different things was when I realized that nothing but me is the problem. I'm the problem. I'm doing this. And someone had to point that out. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I was with a guy that I just really thought should look. Here's the thing: people are my employees. This is how I used to think. I'm just going to give you an because I'm God, right? Like I don't need to like do steps or like go to therapy or do anything like that. If I am getting everything that I want out of the people that I think should be giving me what I want, mm -hmm. you know, so in my head, like I'm superior in the morning, but at nighttime when I go to sleep, like I'm gonna die a cold, dark, lonely death. But when I'm feeling superior, I need you to do this. I need you to act this way. My mom can't tell me that I don't love myself. I will punch her, not really, but she gets it like with words. I act out. Like if I don't get what I need from someone, I will cut and cut and cut and cut because I, it, that's my way of feeling like I have control of something. Mm -hmm. So I beat myself into a state of submit, like reasonableness because the relationship didn't work. He didn't want me. And I was like, what? Which is terrible because I have this massive ego that thinks, what do you mean you don't want to be with me? I'm awesome. But I was terrible to him mm -hmm. right and then I didn't really have friends because it was all about me like I never called anyone and said hey how are you mm -hmm. I would just be like this bitch blah 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 blah. can you believe I did that yeah but I found this because I was stalking and it was just very one-sided I was a fair-weathered friend and so my mom was scared to death of me at eight and a half years she said I sounded more crazy then than I did when I would call her like high as a kite on cocaine mm -hmm. at 3 a.m. That's pretty telling yeah and and I was in this delusion that I felt, I, I, turned, I started speaking victimese again, you know? It's their fault. Because I, I hated that I had to look at everything that I did and keep a close eye on my behaviors when everyone else acts like assholes, mm -hmm. why can't I? And so you, we, I had to get to a point where I truly was just being sober for myself. It wasn't to keep jobs. It wasn't to be an advocate. It wasn't to like show people that I wasn't an asshole. Like I, I had to get to the point where I couldn't care what people thought of me because I cared so much what people thought of me that I almost killed myself in the process. Well, I always say codependency and fear is what underlies addiction. For sure. Right? Scratch it off I think and then... You can, I think you can die from codependency. I, I know yeah. that only too well. So, yeah. I th Listen, let me tell you how I can die from a sober state. This is fun. So my head, while I'm driving down the street, will tell me, <clears throat> you know, if you listen to this song, that'll make you feel better, right? But I know it's not on the radio, so let me look it up on my phone because I, I just need to hear this song. It's going to make me feel so much better. So I'm going through my phone. I have to switch it over from, like, phone to the Bluetooth mm -hmm. or auxiliary or whatever. Look up the thing and I, while I'm driving, right? And this is me putting my life on the line because I need to feel better by driving and trying to hear a song. Because when it's about me all the time, all I'm thinking about is how am I gonna meet my own needs? Yeah, What's gonna make me feel good? How can I feel good? And and also, how can I get them to act the way that I feel as though they should so that I'm comfortable? Because So that I don't have to be uncomfortable in their discomfort. <laughs> right, like right. would you just stop being uncomfortable like I just yeah. can't deal with you? Right. Like, Right. But now I've gotten to the point where I'm very clear today that no one can make me feel anything. No one can make me feel anything.
from you. Yeah. So if someone wants to walk up to me today and say you're a cokehead whore, I'm like, well, yeah, I've done that, you know. And and oh, and, and I've done posts about yeah, that. Like, right. listen, no one in this world is perfect, right? And we all have to have experiences because if we don't have some type of experience, there's not going to be a need for change or growth. I hope that I always stay teachable. I wasn't teachable for a long time, and when I would go to bed at night, I would see like a gun emoji going to my head. Like, I don't think that I would have ever killed myself, but the thought was there, and the message was, well, that's the point. And that's not what life is supposed to be about. You know, life is so much more than just, like, holding on to your seat or just say no. I think it's about being transparent like you have been today. Yeah. And we are so grateful at Recovery Today that you did this interview. Thank and you. took the time. Of course. You know, to spread this message. I think you're going to help a lot of people with this interview. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.